In this module, we're going to take a look at the proxy design pattern. And the proxy is all about providing an interface for accessing a particular resource by essentially replicating that interface. So let's talk about the motivation for using the proxy, or at least one of the motivations. So let's suppose that you're making a call to foo.bar. So there is some assumption in this regard. You're, for example, you're assuming that the object foo is uh, actually in, available in the process where you're running things, and uh, the foo is in the same process as the bar invocation. Now, that might not necessarily be the case, because at some point later on, maybe not now, but maybe later, you want to put all the foo-related operations into a separate process. So whenever somebody calls foo.bar here, you actually want to take all the arguments to foo.bar, you want to marshal them over the wire, and actually execute everything that's related to this object on a separate machine. In fact, the .NET framework allows you to do this. We have certain base classes like Marshall by Ref Object, which allows you to do precisely this. So the big question is, can we actually avoid changing our code if we want to do this? So this is where the proxy design pattern comes to the rescue. And the idea is very simple. So you have an object, which is the proxy object, which has exactly the same interface as what you've been used to, what you've already been working with maybe, but it provides entirely different behavior. So uh, for example, in the case that we are describing here, the proxy, the kind of proxy that you would provide in place of foo, maybe you would have some sort of remote foo implementing the ifoo interface. This is what's called a communication proxy. So it's something that uh, kind of substitutes a different execution model where the invocations aren't actually local. They only appear to be local, but when you actually call foo.bar, what bar does is it takes all the arguments, puts them into serializable structures, and then marshals it off to wherever, for example. And there are lots of other different kinds of proxies. For example, you can have logging proxies where on every invocation, in addition to actually calling the underlying object, you also perform logging. You can have virtual proxies, you can have guarding proxies. So a guarding proxy is something where uh, you check access control Whenever somebody calls a method, you check whether they're in fact allowed to call this kind of method. And there are lots of many other different varieties. So the proxy design pattern is all about providing a class which functions as an interface to a particular resource. So that resource, it may be remote, it may be expensive to construct, it may require logging or some other additional functionality. So once again, this is the idea of uh, providing additional functionality on the object, but the nature of that functionality doesn't have to be intrinsic to the object itself. So for example, you might want to have a protection proxy over all your objects and have authentication rules so that you, you specify some sort of custom security policy where some people are only allowed to touch certain parts of the API, but certainly not all the range of APIs available. We're going to begin by looking at a very synthetic example of a protection proxy. And a protection proxy is something which checks whether you have the right to call a particular method or whether you have the right to access a particular value. So here is a classic example. Let's suppose that we have an interface called iCar and it has a single method called drive. So this method can be implemented by an actual car. So we're going to have an actual car which implements iCar. And here I'm going to implement the member. And here for driving a car, I'll just write line that the car is being driven. Okay, now what we want to do is we want to control people who are too young don't go ahead and drive the car because that could be dangerous. So what we do is we make a car proxy and the car proxy is something which has the same interface as a car but performs additional checks. So here what we can do is we can make a class called car proxy which is also going to implement a car. It's also going to implement iCar, so it has to implement that drive member. But in addition, what you can do is you can, for example, have a constructor which takes a driver. So we can think of a driver as just a person which has an age. So I'll have a public int age here. And then we take the driver in the constructor. So I'll have driver driver, and I'll initialize it in the constructor like so. And then we change the behavior of drive. So even though we can aggregate the car here, so we can have private car car equals new car and that's the car that's going to be driven we can actually check whether or not this particular person is actually old enough to drive so here we can say if driver dot age is greater than or equal to 16 for example then yes it's okay you can take the car and you can drive it otherwise 
what we can do is we can, for example, write line that you are too young, too young like so. So this is how you implement a simple protection proxy and we can start using it. So we can say I car, I car car equals new car proxy. So notice if you had a car here, you could change it to a car proxy without any problems because they have identical APIs. And here we can make a new driver who is age 12. And let's make a constructor for the driver just so that it's a bit more convenient. So I'll do C to our P here. There we go. And now we can try driving the car and we can see what the result is. So we can say car.drive like so and execute this. And we are saying too young. And if we change the age to 22, for example, then now the car is being driven. So this is an example of a protection proxy. And you see these sorts of things in frameworks like ASP.NET, whether you want to check uh, whether the current user has the access rights to call a particular method or to access a particular REST resource, for example, you simply make a proxy over the existing component, you replicate the API. So it's very similar to other design patterns like decorator where you replicate the API. But the key thing here about proxy is you don't really add any new members. You add new functionality in existing members, but you don't go ahead and add some other members as well. Before I went into algorithmic trading, I used to be an ordinary .NET developer, and the first job that I ever got as a .NET developer, I was working on a project where people built something called a property proxy, and this is something that is very common, and lots of people are doing it all over the place. Now, the reason why we had a property proxy in back where I was working was that we had every measurement being recorded in a measurement system by being exposed in two or three measurement systems. So for example, you could expose a property uh, like temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit or Kelvin, and you wanted to have a way of quickly converting it and exposing it through some sort of property value. Now, uh, the property proxy is actually a very simple construct to build, but it does have a few caveats. So let's actually build one. Now, a property proxy is basically the idea of using an object as a property instead of just a literal value. So here we'll have a class called the property of T. So this is going to be the type, uh, the type uh, that's going to encapsulate a property of type T, and it's going to keep it as an object. So I'm going to say property of T, where T has a default constructor, that's pretty much all that we need. And now we need to actually store the property. So we're going to have private T value that stores the value that we want to uh, keep an actual fact and we may as well want to have some constructors. So let's have an empty constructor and let's also have a constructor which actually initializes the value. So I'm going to go into generate code and make a constructor which initializes the value, get rid of all these null checks here. Now in the case of a default invocation here, you may as well remember it can be a reference type. So you may as well initialize it with whatever the default is for the type of T. So here, uh, for example, you can uh, say something like the following. So we can uh, initialize it by calling this. And here, uh, I, I would typically do something like the following activator create instance of T. So that is a factory method on the activator. And this actually makes an instance of T. Now, in addition, you can put a default of T here, but the default of T will give you a null for a reference type. So if you do it like this, and you have a null value, that's going to be a null. Uh, that's not so great for strings, for example. So for string, you might want to have some value instead of no value, but it doesn't really matter. The point is we have a bunch of constructors, but we also want to expose this uh, property somehow. And the reason for that is that we'll need to actually manipulate this object from the outside in just a moment. And I'll explain why. So we'll have a public T a value property with a capital V this time around. So let's suppose that in our model, and the reason why we're building a property proxy is that we want to prevent duplicate assignments. So if the value is already 10 and you try to assign it to 10, we do nothing. That's our uh, domain specific behavior. That's the reason why we're building this. So we may as well leave the getter in the default state so we can say that the getter just returns a value, but the setter is more interesting because we check whether we already have this value. And if we do, we just return. So we say if equals this dot value and value, then we simply return. Otherwise, we may as well write line some sort of informational uh, line about what's going on. So we're assigning value to and then let's put the value in here and we then perform the actual assignment. So this dot value equals value. So this is our publicly exposed property. Now next up, what we need to do is, uh, or 
what would be nice is some implicit conversions to and from t. So we may as well do that. So we'll have public static implicit operator t where you convert to, let's say, an int from a property of int, something like that. Uh, and here it's very easy. Actually, I should uh, fix the spelling here. Do I get to rename it? Uh, yeah, property, there we go. Okay, so in this case, we return property dot value. So this handles the case where you somebody writes int and equals and they use property of int, for example. And the reverse case is public static implicit operator property of t, which uh, takes a value. And in this case, we return new property of t. Uh, with the value, obviously. And this takes care of the case, like if somebody writes property of int p equals 123, for example, that's uh, what the implicit conversion in this case would handle. In addition, I would typically go into generate code and generate the equality members. So I would just pick a value of t and you may as well just add everything in the kitchen sink here. So let's just press finish and we get lots of generated code. Now, there are caveats here, like for example, the fact that we're using, like if you look at the hash code, we're using a non read only value. So as the object value changes, the, the uh, hash code will change, but that's okay, because we actually, uh, in the implementation, what we might want to do is we might want to actually return value get hash code like this. So this is a uh, more correct implementation. But then of course, you have these concerns about well, what if it's null and all the rest of it, so it can be uh, quite tedious. And once again, value is not read only. So if it's an primitive type, and not a reference type, then you're asking for trouble because the hash code will be changing. But let's not digress here. So we have everything that we need in our property of t and we can now start using it. So for example, if we were defining a creature in a computer game, you would define it like this, you would say creature, and then you would say public property of int um, agility, yet and set, for example, now you might think that this is correct, and that everything is fine. Unfortunately, if you go with this approach, the code that we've written for the setter here will actually not be executed. Let me explain why. Let's suppose that you you write something like the following var c equals new creature, and then you assign the agility, you say c dot agility equals 10, for example, now you're probably thinking, well, okay, if I'm doing this, then what's really happening is somebody says c dot set underscore agility with a value of 10. Unfortunately, no, this isn't what's going to happen. Because remember, in C sharp, unlike C++ and many other places, you cannot overload the assignment operator. So what happens with assignment is, as you may have guessed, we're using an implicit conversion from T. And remember, an implicit conversion makes a new object instead of changing the existing one. So you're replacing this with a brand new property. Uh, and essentially what you're doing is you're saying uh, something like the following, you're saying C dot agility equals new property of int with the value of 10, because that's how we implemented it. So the question is, well, what if we want the mutating behavior instead? How do we lay in C sharp, the only way to actually get this behavior is to rewrite this as a combination of field and property. So you would have your property of int called agility, with all the behaviors that you need from a property of int. And then of course, uh, you would make this private. And for the public part, instead of having a property of int, you just have an int. You have public int agility, and then for the getter, uh, you uh, return agility.value, and for the setter, obviously you say agility.value equals value, and this is the way that you would go about implementing this. So first of all, let's actually step into the code. I'm gonna stick a breakpoint uh, right in here, and let's debug this, and ju just see the fact that it does actually work, and it does land us in the correct place. Of course, what we have to do is we also have to initialize the property, because otherwise, uh, it's null by default. So let's make a new property of int, and let's try this again, and see how it goes second time round, second time round. So as you can see, we're here in the setter, we're comparing the current value, which is zero, with the value being assigned, which is 10, they're not equal. So we do the output, and then we return. So that is fine. And now what we can do is we can call this twice, we can actually call the assignment to agility twice with the same value, and see if we actually get the same result. So I'm going to say, uh, c dot agility, 
equals 10 once again and we're going to execute this and just look at the output so as you can see even though we assigned the value twice we're only actually assigning it once because our implicit implementation of a property proxy that we've built checks for identical assignments and prevents them by returning from here. So this is hopefully a good illustration of how to build a property proxy as well as some of the limitations that you get because typically the uh, this part wouldn't have to be required in a language like C++ because you could simply overload the assignment operator and specify what happens if you assign it in the uh, to a property of int or if you assign a t to a property of t but unfortunately in c sharp you end up doing uh, these kinds of uh, things which are unpleasant to write i must admit but there is really no way around it so hopefully you appreciate this example of properties being expressed as entire classes instead of just individual values in this lesson, we're going to take a look at yet another proxy type, and this one is sufficiently different for us to dedicate a lesson to it, because it's not like the others. In most cases, when we were talking about proxies, we were talking about proxies over types which had lots of features, lots of methods, different kind of functionality. Now, a value proxy is a proxy that is typically constructed over a primitive type. Now, why would you want to construct a proxy over something like an int or a float? Well, there are many answers to this. The most obvious answer is you want stronger typing. So, for example, let's suppose that you have some method. Let's suppose you have just uh, some static uh, method called foo, which takes an integer x. Now, let us suppose that the integer uh, that gets passed into foo can only represent, let's say, the price of an item in dollars. How would you implement this? Well, there is no way for us to explicitly say, hey, explicitly say, hey, this can only be a price because, well, it's an int. You can stick anything you want into an int. So you can certainly go ahead and specify the name of the argument as being price, but that doesn't help much either because people can stick anything in here. You could have a negative value, for example, that's being stuck in here, even though maybe we don't allow negative values in the price. So what do you do? Well, one of the most obvious ways of dealing with this is building a value proxy. Now, a value proxy is essentially just a wrapper around a primitive type, a primitive value, which then provides a bunch of conversion operators to and from that value. So you might have a public struct called price where you would have the uh, value as a private member. You would have some sort of constructor for actually initializing that member. And then, of course, you would have the implicit conversion operators to price from int and to int from price. Really obvious things. Now, with the price, what you would then do is you would simply specify price here and you are set you're getting an additional layer of safety in the sense that you know that people are not going to stick anything in here but maybe they will because if you define an implicit conversion operator from an int to price then they can still keep sticking ints in here so maybe this is something that you actually want to avoid so price is just a very simple example but what we're going to take a look at is a real world example from something that i personally use and that is the idea of storing a percentage value now percentages are specific because they don't just store a value they also transform it when we talk about 50 percent of a hundred for example what do we mean by that well we don't mean that we multiply 50 by 100 we actually what we do is we first of all convert the 50 percent into a multiplier so 50 percent is actually 0.5 and so the first thing we do is we need to perform this conversion somewhere behind the scenes and only then can we actually apply this in for example multiplying it by some other value so let's actually implement the percentage value proxy so it's going to be a public struct called percentage and the first thing that uh, we're going to have here is we're going to have the actual field for storing the value so i'll have private read only uh, float value. I'm choosing the uh, single precision data type here, but you're welcome to use either double precision or in fact what you can do is you can make this type generic. You can define a type T and then just, just replace the float with T so that you can control whether you're using floating point or double values as the underlying. I'm just going to stick with floating point uh, single precision types for this particular example. 
So let me show you what we actually want to build. What do we actually want as the end result? So here is the kind of things that we want to be able to calculate. So we want, for example, to take the value 10 and I'll take it as a float value and we want to multiply it by 5% something like this or for example what we want to do is we want to be able to add let's say two percent and three percent so we want to be able to say something like two percent plus uh three percent and we want to be able to actually have it print not just five or 0 0.05 we want it to print five and then uh the actual uh, percentage symbol. So how can we get all of this? How can we get the correct operation? Well, first of all, what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to uh, invoke this on a literal. And the only way you can do this is with extension methods. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a static class called percentage extensions. So percentage extensions is going to allow us to construct a percentage class or struct in this case, from a value like an int. So we'll have something like public static uh, percentage percent. So we'll have percent from uh, int value. And all we have to do here is we take this value and remember this is the final multiplier. This is the thing that we need to multiply. So we take the value, we divide it by 100 and we return a new percentage uh, with this value initialized value divided by 100.0f. Now, one thing you might notice here, which is a bit of a problem, is that the constructor to percentage happens to be public. This isn't uh, a particularly good thing. And the reason why it's not a good thing is because then uh, you need to explain to people what it means to be able to call this constructor. What does it actually give you? So one thing you could do, I suppose you could just uh, change it to internal. This uh, does improve things somewhat, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, you, you still have this, you still have this issue that if people are working with this type uh, inside the assembly that the, where this type is defined, they might call this constructor without really understanding what's going on. Anyways, the idea of writing 5% is that the value 0.05 gets placed into value. Now, we also need a similar overload for integers because you can see that we still have an error here. So, Ryder is saying that you cannot apply well, you cannot apply the multiplication operator, but let me show you uh, something uh, that's also interesting. If I were to change this to a float, then this would be invalid now. And the reason it would be invalid is because 5 is an int and not a float. It cannot be automatically converted or promoted to a float. It does not work. So essentially what I would do in this case is I would just create overloads. So I would have an overload for both float as well as int, and this covers all the cases. Obviously, we still have a problem that you cannot multiply a float value by a percentage value. And this is something that you can do using custom operators. So here, what you would do is you would define, for example, the multiplication operator. So you would have something like public static float operator times where you take the float F as well as percentage P and you simply return uh, F multiplied by P dot value. There we go. So this is how you would implement a uh, multiplication. And notice now this line is okay, because that's exactly what we're doing. We're multiplying a float by a percentage value. Obviously, if you were to spec out this class, if you were to implement all the necessary operators here, you would have lots of operators. Unfortunately, there is no way around this. There is no way to define symmetric operations, meaning that if I multiply a percentage by a float, I cannot say that this does the same thing just with the arguments reversed. There is no way of doing it automatically, so you would have to do a bit of work to implement this. Now, another thing that we want to do is we want to be able to add two percentage values. Once again, this is something where you would have to define your own operators for all the binary uh, functions that you would support. So, for example, in the case of percentages, that would be addition, multiplication, division, and subtraction. You cannot, you probably don't want to uh, take a percentage to the power of a percentage or anything like that, but you do want to be able to add them. So, here you would define a static percentage operator plus and here you would take two percentage values so percentage a and uh, percentage b and uh, what you would do here is uh, fairly obvious really because you because you would just have to 
uh, grab the uh, take make a new percentage so you would return a new percentage where you take the two values and add them together so a dot value plus b dot value and this hopefully uh, covers uh, the uh, uh, the last line in our example the, this one where we add the two percentages together so a few things that you might want to also implement as part of this class you might want to have uh, two string implemented nicely showing the actual percent value so here if you add two percent and three percent the internal value of the resulting percentage will be 0 0.05 but you do want to show five percent and not 0 0.05 so here if i were to override to string what i would probably put in here in the return value is i would actually uh, uh, take the value and I would multiply 100 and then put uh, the percentage sign after it. So this is how I would print that value. You might also want to have a nice uh, debugging uh, display. So you would define uh, debugger display to be something very similar. So you would once again have value multiplied by uh, 100 and then put the uh, put their percentage sign after it. In addition, you might want to define get hash code, and obviously the hash code of uh, this thing is the hash code of the underlying. In actual fact, what, what you can uh, do is you can just uh, use the uh, use the code generation facility. So uh, let's see if I can I'll find those. I don't have the insert key on my uh, keyboard, so uh, you would generate uh, no, not a constructor. You would generate. Uh, Let's see, uh, you would generate the quality members. That's probably what you need. So here you would use the value uh, and you can overload all sorts of uh, quality operations. This puts in quite a bit more plumbing into your code. And obviously get hash code here just uses the hash code of the underlying value, which is completely correct. This is the kind of behavior that you would actually want. And so with all of this set up, what you have is a value proxy, which masquerades as a number, but it's really not. It's something that does its own behind the scenes kind of manipulations. So I'm going to actually run this and we'll take a look at what we get uh, as we uh, run both of these examples. Hopefully we get the uh, the right things. So here when multiplying 10 by 5% you get 0 0.5 and when taking 2% and 3% together as you can see we're getting 5%. So a value proxy is not a particularly common proxy but sometimes you really do want to wrap just a single primitive type primitive value with some sort of iterative value with some sort of additional plumbing which in many cases doesn't really do anything and just stores the value and gives it a strongly typed wrapper so to speak but in this case you also perform additional operations and certainly the extension methods here provide additional syntax sugar that we can use to construct these value proxies on demand. Now, you're probably thinking I'm just pulling things out of thin air, but there is a combination of the proxy and composite design patterns that I want to show you. And this is a composite proxy which allows you to implement a pattern or a construct, which is quite often called an array of structures, structures of array paradox. So let me first of all explain why this exists and it's particularly something that's present in game development but it will also be relevant to anyone who is processing any kind of large volumes of structured data so let's consider the game development example let's suppose you have a game and the game has uh, a large number of creatures which participate in the game so each creature uh, might have certain traits like for example they might have an age so I would have that as a byte and they might also have some sort of position on the game map, the game map. So they might have uh, X and Y coordinates, for example, and maybe they have something else. Now, this uh, data structure, this class, as you can see, I'm using a byte here. So that would be a single byte and this would be typically four bytes. Uh, it's a somewhat uneven structure we don't really know exactly how it's going to be stored maybe what comes after the byte will be padded so that it fits into the uh, word size of the cpu who knows so we have this creature let's suppose that we have let's say 100 creatures participating in the game so you might do something like the following you might have an array uh, creatures equals new creature 
uh, 100. Now, obviously, you would initialize each of the creatures. I'm going to sort of skip that part. But then what you might want to do is you might want to take, for example, every single creature and increase uh, their x coordinates, so move them all to the right by one cell or whatever. So you'd write something like for c in creatures, and you would say c dot x plus plus. This code looks very innocent. It looks very well. It's correct code. It will in fact work. But the problem with this is that this approach is not memory efficient. Modern CPUs really like data to be uh, sort of next to one another. They really like data to be in a predictable sequence so that you know how many bytes to move from one location to another. Now, obviously, in this particular case, uh, the compiler and the CPU, they will collectively figure out how to access the uh, X coordinate of each of the creatures. But if you think about the memory layout, if you think about the way these creatures are laid out without all the .NET trappings and so on, so you have well, the layout is like this. You have age, x, y, and then the other creature, age, x, y, and then age, x, y. So essentially, when it comes to actually changing the x coordinate, it has to go here, and then it has to jump to here, and then it has to jump to here. Well, guess what? The CPU would be much more efficient if you were to change the way things are laid out. So that first of all, you have uh, an array with all the age values, and then you have an array with all the x values, and then you have an array with all the y values, because then if you were to change all the x's, you would just go through this part of the array, you would go nicely from one cell to another, and it would be much faster in on a modern CPU. So the question is, how can we actually implement this? How can we get this to uh, perform better on modern hardware without really changing anything in terms of, uh, you know, fundamentally reworking the creature class? Well, the only way you can do this is if you actually implement uh, what I would call a composite proxy, or you would, in other words, implement a collection of creatures where the internal storage is completely different, but the API different, but the API is more or less the same. Because the only kind of API that we really want in this case is we want to be able to enumerate something. So we want something that's enumerable and that stores the creature data, but stores it in a very kind of bunched up order. So first of all, you have all the ages, then you have all the x's, then you have all the y's. So let's try to build such a class. So you would have a class called uh, creatures. So uh, in a class, you would uh, have uh, the size. So you would specify how many elements there are. So I would have uh, private read only int size like this. And this is something you, you would actually provide in the constructor. But in addition, you would actually store the ages, the x's and the y's. And once again, we can use arrays to store all of this data. So here I can have private byte array for age and I can have a private integer uh, arrays for x and y. And then what I can do is I can initially here in the constructor. So I can say that age is going to be a new byte array with the particular size, and the same goes for the x's and the y's. So x equals new int array uh, of size, and let's just duplicate this and do the same for y. So this is how you would allocate the data. And now you notice that the data is nicely aligned, so to speak, in the sense that, first of all, you have all the ages, and then you have all the x's, and then you have all the y's. But the question is, how can we actually access any element of this array and actually get an API which looks like a creature. Now, I'm not even going to bother extracting the interface from creature. I'm just going to give you an identical interface, which is what the proxy pattern is all about. So you would have something like a creature proxy. Uh, creature proxy. Now, notice I'm using a struct here because it's not actually going to, to store any uh, any significant values. The only thing that we need to store is the index of the creature to access and uh, a reference to the overall set of creatures. So let me show you how this will work. We're going to start by building a constructor. So the constructor is going to take two things. It's going to take a reference to all the creatures and then it's going to take a reference to the index of the creature we're actually interested in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, have fields for both of these. So let's initialize creatures, let's initialize the index as well. And then what we really want to be able to do is to give out a reference 
which actually refers to a, an age of a particular creature or their x or y coordinates. Here is the interesting thing. Here is how you would define it. You would say public ref byte age. And here you return ref create age at a particular index. So what's going on here? Well, whenever somebody accesses this proxy, they can start working with things like age as well as the X and Y coordinates as well. Let me actually just uh, drop these down here below. So you have the age, the X and the Y, but all these really are is they are references into the arrays that we've defined up here. So they're not real. They're not just ordinary fields of this particular struct. Instead, uh, this struct is just a placeholder. It's just something that allows you to access the uh, particular element. All that's changeable in the struct is the index. So the index tells you where exactly you're looking into. Now, theoretically, you could expose the index as public so that people could modify it, but I'm just going to keep it here as private. So another question is, well, how can we, uh, how can we have a for each on a creature or each on a creatures? Uh, that's not exactly difficult. We don't even need to explicitly implement get enumerator. We just need to write it. What I mean is we don't need to implement I enumerable of T or anything. I can just say public I enumerator uh, creature proxy. So here, notice I'm going to be giving out these proxies as opposed to actual creatures. And so I enumerator creature proxy get enumerator. Okay, and here is what we do. So for every single position from zero to size, we return a new creature proxy. So here I'm going to say for int pause equals zero, pause less than size, plus plus pause. What we're going to do is we're going to return uh, or yield return uh, rather, yield return a new creature proxy uh, where this gets passed into the actual proxy and the index is pause. Okay, so what, what we can do with this setup is we can use almost the same API as up here, but get all the performance benefits. So essentially you'll say something like var creatures two, and instead of using an array, you would say new creatures uh, passing in the value 100. So here you would create 100 creatures. And obviously in, if you look at the actual constructor here uh, for uh, creatures, we are automatically allocating all the memory that those creatures actually require. So there is no need to then go through every single one of them and call a constructor on it like we would here, because this is just a placeholder for a hundred nulls basically. So here, once you have creatures too, you can say for each var c in creatures two, and here you would say c dot x plus plus. So this is how you would actually modify every single one of the creatures. But this time around is completely different. We can actually replace this var by specifying the type explicitly. And you can see that the type here is creatures.creature proxy. So we're essentially modifying something on the proxy. So when you say c.x plus plus, what you're really getting when you're saying c.x is you're referencing into creatures. Uh, dot x at a particular index, so at the index that you've specified for that particular creature, you're going into it, you're getting that reference, and then using that reference to increment that particular value. So the takeaway from this example, and it's a sufficiently complicated example, is that sometimes you build proxies for purposes of performance improvements. So in this case, we want all the data related to a particular, well, all the data of a particular data type, in actual fact, being put together in an array of uh, essentially a contiguous chunk of memory that's easier and more efficient to traverse than having to jump between the elements. So we've put this all together and we, and we now are able to, to go through this. So uh, just uh, to explain you the terminology behind all of this. So this thing is essentially an array of structures, A, O, S. And what we've done here is we've made a structure of arrays. And uh, what we talk about is we talk about this AOS uh, SOA duality. So we talk about the way that you can represent things one way or another. If you look at programming languages such as J, for example, that's where this is implemented implicitly in the language. You can just say this is this struct is going to be a, an SOA struct, and then it gets automatically converted. We don't have that kind of automation here in C Sharp, but we are able to build proxies which do pretty much the same thing. 
I wanted to share yet another example of a composite proxy and this is going to take us back to the discussion we had in the composite design pattern where we looked at array backed properties. So now what we're going to take a look at is a situation which is very strongly tied to user interfaces. So in user interfaces sometimes you have a bunch of checkboxes that you want to switch on or off and then you have a grouping checkbox which if you tick it it sets or unsets every single one of the related checkboxes so the question is how do you actually implement this in code and uh, the answer is that you use a composite proxy property i know it's getting really complicated so let me show you an example that i actually have in one of my applications i'm going to try and simplify this a little bit but essentially i have a bunch of different boolean flags for the kinds of uh, masonry that i want to generate for a house so i have a bunch of booleans for generating uh pillars and walls and floors of house so in addition to having uh these variables bound to checkboxes in the user interface i also want a grouping checkbox where i can tick this checkbox and it will set or unset every single one of these properties or fields so how do you do it well uh one approach is to simply use a composite proxy property uh nothing particularly complicated here you just make a public boolean property called all so when you want to set every single property to a particular value, you simply uh, do it. You say pillars equals value and you duplicate this. Well, obviously, uh, duplicate it like this. And then you also set the walls and the floors as well. So this is easy. If somebody checks a single checkbox, they set every single other checkbox automatically. But what about the getter? what about the getter because obviously if all of these values are true then you should return a true if all of these values are false you should return a false but what if they are different what if pillars is true and walls is false for example walls is false for example what do you return then and the answer is well you are supposed to return null and that's one of the reasons why we have nullables and tri-state logic so let me show you how this works so um if you want a getter, you basically have to change this property from a boolean to a nullable boolean, which automatically invalidates all of this stuff. Because essentially now what you have to do is you first of all have to make sure that somebody's passing in a non-null value. So if the value doesn't have an any actual value if it's null then we return otherwise instead of setting value we set value dot value i know it sounds like repetition but that's the way things are set up here so this is how you'd implement this and then of course for the getter you basically have to make sure that every single property has the same value if they all have the same value then you can return that value otherwise you return null so if uh, pillars is equal to walls and uh, walls is equal to floors, then all the variables are the same and you return pillars. Otherwise, you return null. So this is the approach you would take if you wanted to have uh, a, a property uh, like all, which would be bound to a user interface component, a checkbox, for example, which would uh, control whether all of these uh, properties or fields are actually set or unset. So we can actually take this approach and we can marry it with the approach of array backed properties that we talked about when we talked about the composite design pattern. So now we can put these two together and we can change this implementation because to be honest, uh, this part is particularly fragile. And if you add additional uh, Boolean values, for example, you have to make sure you have the additional checks here. You have to make sure that you have the appropriate appropriate assignment here. How do you make this code safer? And the answer is array back properties, the approach that we've talked about in the composite design pattern. So let me comment everything out and everything out and comment this out. And we're going to re-implement this example, but we're going to do it using array back properties. So what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a private Boolean array for the fields called flags. And I'm just going to put uh, three Booleans in there. And then when I want to expose the pillar property or the walls property or the floors property, I just do it using a property. So I say public bool pillars. And here, uh, for example, uh, let, me, let me just uh, undo this. Obviously, there is an error somewhere. Let me just try to uh, find it. I think I've commented out the entire class. Yeah, that's, that's an obvious problem. So uh, let's... Uh, uncomment this and uh, I'll do it like this okay so now we can uh, we can actually implement this so pillars for example for the setter uh, for instance you would see uh, flags at position zero equals value for the getter you would return flags at zero 
uh, and you would do the same for the uh, floors and the walls. Let me just uh, copy over some code here like so. So this is how you would implement array back properties. Essentially for walls, you return flags at one. For floors, we operate on flags at two. And now if you want to re-implement the uh, composite property called all, you can do this uh, knowing that flags is in fact an array. In actual fact, we may as well make it read only. So let's implement uh, all once again. So it's once again uh, going to be a Boolean, nullable Boolean called all, but now the getter and the setter are uh, more reliable, shall we say. So for the getter, you say if uh, flags dot skip one, if all of these are equal to uh, flags at zero, uh, then uh, you return flags at zero. Otherwise, you return null. So basically, you compare the value of the first element, so you skip the first element, and you make sure that the first element is equal to all of the other elements. And if that's the case, then, then you return that element, otherwise you return null. And for the setter, it's a simple for loop. So once again, we check that the value has a value. If not, then we simply return, and then we just make a for loop with i going from zero to flags.length, and here, what we do is we say flags at position i equals value dot value. And that's pretty much it. So this is how you can implement a UI centric, in this case, a composite property using the array backed properties approach. With proxies, like with other components, which wrap other components, you basically have a choice between static and dynamic. And certainly static is going to be the faster option, the preferred option, but sometimes you want something called a dynamic proxy. And that is a proxy which is constructed at runtime with all the associated performance costs. So we're gonna take a look at how a dynamic proxy works. So here I have an interface called iBankAccount, and I have an implementation with a bank account which actually does the typical deposit and withdraw operations. Now, one of the things I want to do is I want to implement logging. So I want to note the number of times that somebody calls the withdraw or deposit method or indeed any other method in bank account. And I don't want to re-implement every single method and uh, proxy over the calls. That way, instead, I want a dynamic proxy. So what you'll see here in the references is I have a reference to impromptu interface, which is a very useful library varies we got package for actually generating the appropriate interface any interface that you want on a dynamic object now why is this relevant well we'll see in just a moment so here i have a scenario for actually working with a bank account i'm making a bank account and i'm depositing 100 and i'm withdrawing 50 dollars and then i'm outputting the information about the bank account so we have some output here but in addition what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to actually log all of this information so i'm going to keep actually a record of how many times each of the methods inside bank account was called so this is going to be a bit complicated but also really cool so we're going to have a class called log of t so this class called log of t is going to inherit from dynamic objects. So you can see we're using the DLR here. In addition, we'll put some constraints on the t argument. So we'll say that t has to be a class and it has to have a default constructor. There we go. Now we want to keep the number of calls to each of the methods of t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a private dictionary. I'm going to have a private dictionary from string to int. So string is the name of the method and int is the number of times the method was called. So this is going to be called method call count. So let's uh, initialize it uh, with the default here. And in addition, what I'm going to actually keep is I'm going to keep a reference to the subject, a reference to the object whose calls we're actually intercepting. So this is going to be private uh, read only T subject. There we go. Okay, so the idea is that you make the log, so you have a constructor, and the constructor takes this subject, so here is t subject, we simply assign it, so we say this dot subject equals subject, and that's pretty much it. But the key thing here is we're going to make a factory method, which is going to be very sly. We're going to have a factory method, which is going to force our dynamic object to behave as if it implements a particular interface. And in our case, the interface is iBankAccount. But we also want logging, so that's something that we'll have to 
implement as well. So first of all, let's deal with the logging. That's the first thing that we need to do. So in order to implement logging, since we're in a dynamic object, what we can do is the following. We can uh, go ahead and uh, if we're going to generate code for a second, we're going to override. Let's go into uh, overriding members here, and we're going to override try invoke member. So that's a dynamic object uh, method, which is used whenever somebody wants to invoke something on this object. So here I'm going to get rid of the default implementation because we're going to do something customized. We're going to try and actually invoke the member, but also log their invocation. So let's put a uh, typical try catch in here. I'll actually get rid of the exception. I'm not going to log the uh, exception itself. Instead, I will just specify the result. So essentially, when you when you uh, do uh, try invoke member, you have this out object result. And if you fail, then we may as well just set it to null. So I'm going to say result equals null, and I will return false because we failed. Otherwise, we're going to do the following. So somebody is invoking some member on a dynamic object. So what do you do? Well, first of all, we want to write line some information. Let's just output a bit of info. So we're invoking, invoking, and we can get uh, the actual uh, name of uh, the object that we're invoking this on. So this would be subject, subject dot get type dot name. So we're invoking uh, this class as dot, and then we can get the binder dot name, which gives us the name of the method that we're invoking with arguments. And here we can actually specify the argument. So for the arguments, we can just do a string dot join over the args. So notice here, let me just scroll left. Here we have the arguments. So we're going to have them uh, in here. So I will have with, uh, let's put square brackets in here, then curly braces, then I'll do string dot join with a comma, and I'll just put the args in here. They'll all be converted to strings. There we go. So this is some diagnostic information. But then, of course, what we want to do is we want to perform even more logging by adding the method call counts. Uh, we're keeping the total number of methods. So if method call count uh, contains key, so we've already invoked this method with binder.name, we just increment. So we say method call count at binder.name uh, plus plus. There we go. Otherwise, we add it. Is that okay? Um, yeah, that should be binder, by the way. Binder, like so. Otherwise, we add the key. So we say else method call count dot add with binder dot name, and it's been called once. So we add a one in here. And then, of course, we set the result. We have to set the result of the actual invocation. So here, what we do is we say result equals uh, subject dot get type dot get type get method with the name so we get the appropriate method with binder.name and then we invoke it so we invoke it with uh, on the subject with the arguments there we go so that's how you actually perform the call and then you return true because everything succeeded obviously so that's the way of implementing try invoke member on a dynamic object while at the same time implementing logging so now all we have to do well we have two things to do first of all we have to make t or log of t uh, give us an interface that we want. So we want an arbitrary interface to be exposed. And the way this is done is using a generic factory method. So we're going to have public static i. So i is going to be the interface type. I'm going to call this as with the interface type argument. And once again, I'll put some constraints. So i has to be a class, although strictly speaking, has to be an interface. And here, if it's not of an interface type, we may as well throw an exception. So if type of i an interface is interface, then we can throw new argument exception where we can complain. I must be an interface type. There we go. Okay, so what we do now is we use the impromptu interface library that we included via a new get package and we return something interesting. We return a new log of t. So we return a new instance of us effectively taking a new t so we construct the object that we're returning and then we invoke act like and this is the impromptu interface part as you can see in the code completion here so act like i so we get the dynamic object to act as if it implemented this particular interface because it really does because when you invoke the members it's going to be dynamic anyway so it's going to implement any interface that you want so this is the approach and now what we need to do is uh, the final part which is writing out some info about all those invocations so i'm going to have public string info here what i'm going to do is just make a string builder 
I'm going to append the information about every single call. So we're going to do for each var kv in method call count. Uh, so that's the key value. So I'm going to append line here. I'm going to append lines. First of all, key value dot key called kv dot value times. If it's one time, it's going to be time. So we'll put the S yes in round brackets and I'll return as B dot to string as always. And that's our dynamic proxy completed. So now we can start using it. So instead of having a bank account here, what we're going to do is we're going to make a log of bank account as I bank account. So it's a bit tricky. So we're making a dynamic proxy, which is going to log calls to a bank account, but then we're returning it as an interface of I bank account. That's what the impromptu interface does. It basically gives you, that's what the impromptu interface does. It basically gives you the interface that you want from a dynamic object. So even though this is a dynamic object, which proxies the calls over to uh, the actual subject, which we are constructing here, uh, it's actually going to work out okay with the interface. So now we have code completion on that interface because BA is of type iBank account. So all the interface members are available. It's not like a pure dynamic object where you get no co code completion because nobody knows what members it has. And then we can write line BA, but in addition, we can also, I guess, output some of the information about uh, this object. So in this case, what we can do is we can write line BA dot info like so and you'll notice that info is actually available because we have that uh we have that interface for uh the uh the actual ibank account instead of having it for uh the overall dynamic object so we have this log of t and uh this method call count is being exposed exposed in uh the actual object so how do you actually get it uh, to uh, be out. But well, one of the ways we can do this, and it's a bit tricky, is we're going to override to string here. So first of all, let me just run this. Let me run this to prove to you that the whole thing is almost the same. But notice the last line. So everything is okay. We are intercepting the invocations. Here is the actual dynamic proxy invocation logging here. So invoking bank account deposit with arguments so and so. However, look look at the last line. The implementation to, to string is completely broken, and the reason why the implementation is broken is because we're now taking to string from the uh, dynamic object, and so we're getting just its default implementation. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this info that we've defined in an override of to string. So I'm going to override to string here, oh, like so. And I'm going to use info, so I'm going to return dollar, and then I'll put the info here, and then I will put the I will put the subject here as well, maybe with a line break in between. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. We should get more information now. So you can see that we're getting statistics now. So we're getting statistics on the method calls. We call deposit one time and we call withdraw one time. So we recorded all the information and then we're getting also the two string from the original object as well. So this is how you build a dynamic proxy. Obviously you're paying with the performance cost in terms of the dynamic construction of the object, but you're getting the flexibility and you certainly don't have to re-implement every single interface member. You can just intercept them using try invoke member. And then the neat trick with the impromptu interface allows you to have your dynamic object acting as if it were implementing a particular interface, which is very handy.